the guest speaker committee endeavours to bring a wide range of interesting speakers to our meetings and I'm sure today's speaker, editor and writer Alastair Starr will tick all the boxes. There was a short bio on Alastair in the bulletin and the title of Alastair's presentation today is Ecstasy Lake, Dark Portrait of Our City. By way of background, as well as a writer of fiction, Alastair is a forester and for the last 25 years or so has been writing and editing on global forest related issues such as climate change, forest insights, illegal logging and sustainable forest management. He is clearly a very talented individual. Alistair has published two novels, the first is Prohibited Zone and the second is Ecstasy Lake. The reviews on Ecstasy Lake have been high in their praise. Ed Wright from The Australian said, a strongly written thriller that combines gold prospecting with the drugs trade. The characters are convincing and the writing taut. There are enough twists to keep the reader guessing until the end while the contradictions of human motivation resonate beyond. It all sounds very intriguing. It's my pleasure to invite Alastair to the podium to give his presentation, Ecstasy Lake, Dark Portrait of Our City. Thanks, Alastair. Well, many thanks uh, for the opportunity to speak to you today. It's a, an incredible privilege uh, for me to do so. Um, as Byron mentioned, the title of my talk is Ecstasy Lake, Dark Portrait of Our City. Ecstasy Lake, also as Byron mentioned, is the title of uh, my novel that was published earlier this year. Um, it's a thriller, but it's also a portrait of Adelaide. And I want to talk to you about about that angle of it today, if I may. By the way, I'm not sure it's an especially dark portrait. I just threw that in to sound intriguing. Um, I've come relatively late to novel writing. Uh, Prohibited Zone, my first novel, was published in 2011 when I was 48 years old. Um, and I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about that novel as well today. And I'll also give you a little bit of my personal background so you know where I'm coming from. And I'll read a couple of excerpts from the novel, from Ecstasy Lake. Uh, on the age thing, I take heart that some famous novelists started pretty late. Uh, Raymond Chandler was 51 when he published The Big Sleep, his first novel. Uh, Richard Adams published Watership Down, which was his first novel when he was 53. I'm not putting myself in the same bracket as those guys, except the same age bracket, but it is heartening to know that age isn't a barrier to, uh, to fiction writing. And I've always wanted to write novels. Uh, I've just taken a fairly circuitous route to get here. I studied forestry at ANU in Canberra in the early to mid-1980s. I've worked on mine sites. Uh, I notice there's quite a few in the mining industry here, petroleum and gas as well. Um, I worked on a gold mine in Western Australia for a while. I've worked in various forests. Uh, I've uh, volunteered for scientists in some pretty amazing places. For example, I spent three months in the Yukon in Canada in midwinter, uh, following snowshoe hares around in the snow. Uh, I also worked for, or volunteered for a three-week stint on Dory Island, which is a, a desert island, uh, uninhabited desert island off the coast of Western Australia. And I spent a fair bit of time following hear wallabies through the sand. And it's a role that's taken me all over the world. I think, like many people here, I've uh, travelled a fair bit. Uh, I've seen the hacked up forests of Borneo, also some of the pristine forests still in Borneo, uh, Amazonian villages, uh, the poverty-stricken farmlands of West Africa, Ghana and, and Cameroon, and also some of the world's great cities. I've lived in Tokyo, I spent a really nice 10 months in Rome. Uh, also spent time in, in uh, New York and London and Kuala Lumpur and all sorts of other places. But I grew up in this city, in Adelaide. And um, I left when I was 19 and I didn't really come back uh, for 25 years, nearly 25 years. Um, I came back for holidays because this is where my parents lived, but it took me a long time probably more than a decade to realise that this was a place where I wanted to live. And it 
took me another decade or so to actually make it back here. Uh, I've been living with my own family in Japan for about eight years, working for an intergovernmental forestry organisation. Uh, when we decided to move back to Adelaide in 2006, specifically to the Adelaide Hills. And at about the same time, I, uh, I decided to have a crack at writing a novel. And um, I wanted it to be a thriller. And, and coming back after so long away, I, I felt that something had changed in Australia. Um, certainly a few things had happened. There'd been a mining boom. Uh, there'd been the Tampa incident, which in which uh, a boatload of asylum seekers was unable to land on Australian soil. There'd been children overboard incident where asylum seekers were accused of throwing children into the sea uh, so the Navy would pick them up. And there were riots in asylum seeker detention centres uh, in Australia, including at the Woomera detention centre out in the Woomera prohibited zone, uh, which is where prohibited zone is largely based. And then there was 9-11, which and the extraordinary fear of terrorism that pervaded the Western world, including Australia, uh, in its aftermath. And from Japan, it seemed clear to me that people were uh, as people in Australia were conflating terrorism and asylum seekers, and were worried that terrorists were entering Australia pretending to be refugees. But leaving aside what that means for the country, uh, it seemed to me to be a really good setting for a political thriller. I won't go into the plot of Prohibited Zone. Um, I will mention, though, it was shortlisted for, for several awards, didn't win any. But, um, but the protagonist is a guy called Steve West, or Westy. And he's a knockabout Aussie bloke, a mining engineer, uh, ex Crows footballer, um, who's never really cared too much about relationships uh, or um, causes, but he somehow becomes entangled with a woman with a cause. When push comes to shove, it turns out that he does care about justice. I mention him because he's also the protagonist of Ecstasy Lake, uh, the second novel. To quote a reviewer of Prohibited Zone, Westy is one of those hard men with, self, with soft democratic centres. He is no untouchable hero. Though he's clever, strong and resourceful, there's plenty of room for improvement in his relationship with women. So in other words, fairly typical Australian male, I think. So, as I mentioned, he's also the protagonist of Ecstasy Lake, uh, which was published uh, this year and it's largely set in Adelaide. And in writing it, I wanted, to, I wanted to present a portrait of this city. Not a tourist brochure kind of portrait, but a, a, grittier, a grittier portrait, uh, perhaps a little bit dark. Um, honest. I want it to be an honest, warts and all sort of uh, portrait. Ecstasy Lake is a thriller, like Prohibited Zone, so it doesn't get bogged down in social commentary. But um, I do think that the best thrillers are firmly embedded in the social and political context of the day, and Ecstasy Lake is set in modern-day Adelaide. If you get the chance to read it, and um, actually there's no reason why you won't, uh, I've brought along a bunch of copies today, um, I think you'll recognise your city. Uh, you may not agree with all the points of view that are expressed in it, but that's kind of the point. I, I really wanted to write a novel that would make people think about the city in a different way perhaps, uh, challenge people and maybe think about how we can improve it. So I'm just going to read a, a, a passage from the novel now just to give you a feel for that portrait and uh, perhaps a little bit of the style of the novel. I'm going to start at the beginning uh, with Steve West coming back to Adelaide after a long time away. We flew in over the low woods of the Mount Lofty Ranges hazy, lazy, and ready to burn. The city lounged between the hills and the blue tongue of the gulf, the Torrens Island power station stacks standing like forgotten survey pegs at the edge of the salt pans. I was on the right-hand side of the plane and had a fine view of the northern suburbs, which sprawled along the seaboard until I couldn't tell where the houses stopped and the dust began. Adelaide, a staid but strangely tortured place that was poorer and drier than most Australian cities and pretended to be more righteous but which had its fair share of dark secrets and psychopaths. We shot out over the Gulf Bank and landed from the west over the Norfolk Island Pines at Glenelg. I hadn't been home for two years. My half-brother Luke was grinning at the top of the ramp as we disembarked. He hugged me and then held me at arm's length and looked at me. You're starting to look old. It's just a jet lag, you cheeky bugger. You're starting to look respectable. 
Not long ago, he had been a dope-smoking, dope binge-drinking university student. Now he was dressed half-decently and had shorn a scruffy beard into fashionable stubble. His grin had faded. It's good to see you, I said. It's good to see you too, man. There's some bad news, though. You remember McKiskey? Yeah, what about him? He's dead. Dead? Other disembarking passengers were moving past, but they were only blurs to me. Yeah, sorry. What happened? The cops say he was murdered. Murdered? Dead. Here in Adelaide yesterday. Jesus, how is that possible? Don't know. He looked at me as we rode the escalator down to the luggage carousel. Luke liked to know how people were feeling. I wasn't feeling much of anything. It was a jet lag. There's something else, but it's good news. What is it? Tasso's in town. He wants to see you. I know. Why do you think I've come back? To see your brother, I thought. Sure, that too, but Tasso called a few days ago and told me he had a proposition. What is it? I don't know. My bag flicked through the rubber flaps and I grabbed it. Outside it was already hot. The sky was blue with a tinge of brown haze, and the northeasterly wind promised to make the place hotter and hazier. I squinted in the harsh Australian glare, enjoying it. A family I recognised from the plane walk past, heading to the car park. The father pushing a trolley loader precariously with suitcases. The mother gripping the hands of two children and looking relieved to be home. Was this my home? I hadn't lived in Australia for much of the last decade. And I'd changed. Maybe the country had changed too. Maybe we'd changed in different directions. So, I love Adelaide. Um, I think we have an unparalleled quality of life here. Um, and that's why I brought um, my family back here to live. I think we're incredibly lucky to live in such a peaceful, beautiful, and generally well-governed place. But I also think it's important that we don't get complacent and I kind of hope that, that um, Ecstasy Lake is a little bit subversive in the views that it has about Adelaide. Uh, unlike Prohibited Zone, Ecstasy Lake isn't, um, isn't overtly political. Prohibited Zone, as I outlined, started with a, a political context of situation. With Ecstasy Lake, I started with a character uh, based very strongly on a good friend of mine, or at least <laughs> he was a good friend. Uh, I haven't heard from him since he read the novel. Um, the plot revolves around the discovery and secret location of a gold ore deposit somewhere in desert South Australia. The man who discovered it, Mick Hiskey, who we just heard had been murdered, uh, discovered it. so he discovered the ore body and, and now only Steve and his friend Tasso uh, know where it's located. Tasso is uh, probably the central character. He's loud, brilliant, extremely wealthy, and he's also very ambitious for the city, for Adelaide. He says he wants to make it great. And there is discussion in the novel about, about whether Adelaide has the potential to be great. And when I was writing the novel, I asked a lot of people, uh, friends and, and um, people I met, Adelaideans, if they thought Adelaide could be a great city. And I was kind of surprised that a lot of people said, nah, I don't think so. Um, and the novel kind of comes to a different conclusion uh, to that. My view is that any city can I'm only a forester and, and a novelist. Um, I'm not a town planner, I'm not a, a political scientist, and probably the least qualified person in this room to, to comment, but I'm pretty sure that it's people that make a city great, and all you've got to do to do that, to, therefore, to have a great city is to unleash their potential, and um, especially the young people, so they can explore their imagination and, uh, and channel their energy constructively into their endeavours. But if most people, most Australians are like me, then um, then we tend to sit back and let things happen. We tend to take uh, a lot of things for granted, I think, and, and um, we're probably a bit complacent about the way we're governed. And I think we need to change that. Um, except I don't know how. But uh, maybe groups like Rotary uh, is a good place to start, and uh, there should be more of it. But the novel is about more than Adelaide. Uh, it's also about greed and power. The pros and cons of a mining boom. Um, it's an exploration of love as well. There's, there are liberal doses of guns, sex, violence, booze, uh, drugs, <laughs> bad language, uh, you name it. So it's entertaining, I hope. Uh, there's a, ba a bikey gang war, there's a, a clandestine drug lab, a, a chase through um, 
mid a moonlight chase through the mangroves out near Garden Island, a shootout at Truro, and much more than that. And many Adelaideans who have read the novel say they, they love reading a novel set so strongly in their own city, um, and it, it features many places that would be familiar to you, like, um, uh, like the salt tank, <coughs> excuse me, the um, shooting range at, uh, on Franklin Street, even Adelaide Oval gets a, gets a mention. Catherine England, who's the, uh, the uh, literary critic in the advertiser, wrote, it's still an unusual treat for Adelaide readers to be able to map their reading on the familiar grid of their own city. Alistair Sarr's second novel suggests he could well do for Adelaide what Peter Corris has long done for Sydney in his arresting and memorable style. And I certainly uh, set out to try and to start that you know, with Ecstasy Lake. I'm afraid the northern suburbs get a little bit of a bad rap. Uh, so I hope nobody is in the northern suburbs here. But, but a thriller needs, a dark, needs dark places and um, exaggerations. But it was certainly fun to write, uh, and um, perhaps there is a little bit of darkness to it, but I also think that it's quite funny in places, and certainly it made me laugh so, when I was writing it. But above all, I hope people are entertained by it, um, but also challenged uh, by the portrait of the city. And so I just thought I'd read a, one last very short piece that kind of delivers the novel service on Adelaide, and I'd certainly be interested any views on what they think uh, about whether Adelaide can be a great city or maybe already is. We flew out over those lovable blue, burnable hills in the east before banking to the north. I watched the city pass below the wing. It was at the far end of the world, sure, but maybe it was the best thing. Tasso was partly right, I thought. It could be a great city one day. I didn't think it needed a mining boom, although maybe a little one would what it needed was imagination and a bit of daring. I just wasn't sure it had enough of either. Time will tell. So, thank you very much uh, for, for listening. And it's certainly, as I said before, a great privilege for me to be able to speak to you today. Thank you also for the really good work that I know Rotary does for our community and for the world. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Bill. Well, most of the forestry that, that I've done has been um, outside Australia. I don't really know the Adelaide, uh, the Australian situation all that well. I know that governments throughout Australia and the world have been selling off forestry assets um, because they uh, they need the they need the capital, they need the money, and governments have invest less and have less and less to invest in those sorts of uh, long-term pursuits. I agree that to some extent it is a, a government responsibility, but I think there are ways that private sector money can also be invested in so, even in long-term ventures. So, sorry that I can't really do that.
I didn't write it thinking that uh, it could be turned into a movie, but uh, uh, people have told me that it, it, both novels actually would make great movies and Prohibited Zone was optioned uh, by a producer. Uh, the option eventually lapsed. But, so I think there's definitely potential for it to be made into a movie and uh, some of Australia's great movies are desert-based. Uh, people love those landscapes and uh, so visually I spent a fair bit of time uh, in intergovernmental conferences where you know, the countries of the world meet and talk and I agree that uh, once upon a time Australia had a fantastic reputation that Thomas Broker in all sorts of um, uh, global debates and issues. Uh, I, I tend to agree that our reputation has declined um, on the back largely of Thank you for that. But I, I do think that that is one of the <coughs> criteria of what makes a great city is that people uh, want to live here. I think we all want to live here. But a lot of the young, they may want to live here, but they can't because uh, the job opportunities are not, uh, are not as strong here as, as they are elsewhere. And that's, that's where I think the city is.
as I say, it's always been something that I wanted to do and I um, hesitated because I didn't think, first of all, I didn't think I had anything to write about and that's, I guess, where you've got to start. But uh, does it take courage? I suppose it, it, what it takes is perseverance. Um, what I realised that you, know, you, you might ride a little bit and it's not like planting a seedling just grows without you don't have to do anything to it. It won't grow unless you keep working at it and so you just got to keep writing one word after another and finding the time to do that and then eventually you'll have a novel. And um, that's the easy part actually. The hard part is, well, a, a harder part is finding a publisher and the hardest part is selling it. You know. So if you want people to read it, so that I see it as a three phase process. Um, the easiest part almost is to write it and that's really just a matter of forcing yourself to sit down and write. And my approach, I think every, every writer has a different approach, but mine is I try and visualise scenes, um, like chains, like the chain of ponds, I always think of the chain of ponds. Each scene takes you a little bit further uh, through the landscape and, um, and builds a picture. And so, and each, each pond is a, is a scene, so I try to visualise it and write that scene Thanks very much and thanks for the questions. Alistair, thanks very much for coming along today. I think you've provoked us just enough to want to buy the book. A special price today of $25 a copy. See Alistair after the, uh, after the meeting closes. On behalf of the club, just a small gift to say thank you. A memento of Adelaide Rotary Club. Thanks very much. And could everyone show their acclaim to Alistair. Thank you. <laughs>